there's a light up there. Oh, yes. Yeah. So. Oh, that, that should be. There you go. That's correct. So if I could ask, if I could ask for visitors just to mute themselves for that, that would really help. Is there a way that you can see everybody or only the person who's speaking? Um, there are different views. I'm, and I'm sorry, there's going to be lots of people. Just sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I get it. I just ask you to be for now and we'll bring you in at the appropriate point. Yes, good morning. Good morning. It's my first time. I didn't know I got some cool. I didn't know I had to install.
final questions, Chair? I'm, I'm mindful we're about three minutes from the start of time, but um, any, anything on the notes to send you? Uh, no, I got the updated um, uh, note, so uh, 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 no problem there. Um, you, you told, um, who was it, um, Catherine Tim, wasn't it? Yes, I've made the direction. It was slightly out of time, but again, we're always trying to accommodate where we can, don't we? So, yeah. Uh, and I've assumed that um, with um, uh, Martin Drew's new uh, question, yes. then question two is no longer on board. Okay. Martin's in the meeting, Chair, yeah? and as we discussed last night, that's also gone to the Director of Public Health, and he will introduce it verbally, um, but obviously because that was a little late, it's, uh, it's a matter of whether officers are able to giving that no it's just i mean just for yourself just, just i mean i can i can do it briefly chair if you wish but normally you just say about muting your microphones and things yeah. of that nature okay are we online well you are believe so chair yeah okay well good morning good morning welcome to you all thank you um for attending this this morning um just to remind um uh, members, etc., that um, when we get into the meat of the um, uh, agenda, etc., um, raising questions, if you press the hand, then I will make a note that you want to ask a question and call you in at the appropriate time. At all other times, please make sure that um, you're muted. Not that I don't like to hear from you, but it's just confusing when you get three or four people talking at the same time. So uh, please mute and um, indicate by pressing the hand when you wish to wish to speak. Uh, so the first item is uh, apologies. Do we have any apologies, uh, Paul? None have been received, Chair. Thank you. And are there any disclosures of uh, pecuniary uh, and non-pecuniary interest? I'm not seeing anything, so I'll take that as read. Uh, the next item... Chair, uh, can I just mention something on that? Sorry, Claire? Yeah. Um, over the, the period of COVID, I've been volunteering at the George Elliott, so I don't know whether you need to mark that as any sort of interest. Uh, I, I wouldn't have thought so, to be quite honest, Claire, no. Just thought I'd check. Yeah. Deci chairman's decision, no. Okay, thanks. Uh, right, on we go. Uh, Chair's announcements. Um, there will be an extra meeting. 
Um, I think you've all been notified uh, of the committee on the 30th of uh, July, 10 o'clock, and we shall be considering um, two items, um, which uh, item one is uh, an item regarding the reinstatement of services um, where, which were altered to respond to the COVID pandemic. And secondly, we have an update on the CCG merger proposals. So they're the two items that we will be discussing uh, at the extra meeting on the 30th of July. Another item for your information is regarding the Horton Hosk, uh, which has now expanded its terms of reference. Uh, this came at the conclusion of the obstetrics maternity service review uh, and the Horton, the Hosk has resolved to continue and to amend its scope to be able to scrutinise a master plan for the hospital. However, in, in order to do this, they do need all three councils to agree the revised scope within the health and scrutiny powers. Uh, and um, that will have to go to our uh, a meeting of our council um, for confirmation that we agree. Um, nothing else I've got. Uh, minutes of the meeting held on the 19th of February 2020. Uh, I'll go through them page by page. Page one. Two, three, four, five, and six. Are they received as a true record? Um, only indicate if you've uh, got something or if you disagree. Um, if I get a clear board on hands, I'll assume that they've all been accepted. Okay. Our next item is um, uh, public speaking. Uh, and I think we have six people registered to speak. Uh, to us today. Uh, I would just remind um, our speakers that you have three three minutes to speak. And the first person, first person I'm calling on um, is Dr. Sharon Hancock. Is Dr. Sharon Hancock there? Yes, I see she is. Dr. Hancock, I think you might be muted at the moment. You just need to unmute your microphone. Sorry, Dr. Hancock, still can't hear you. You're muted at the moment. If you hover your cursor over over the screen where the, uh, where the faces are, you should see a little bar pop up and a microphone, which you're able to unmute yourself. So again, if you just hover over the screen of your, your device, you should see a little bar pop up, which, which enables you to unmute your microphone. I can, I can literally read that you said you've done that, but you're still muted. Uh, sorry. Unfortunately, we're not able to do that for you. Okay, I can hear you having some difficulty. Chair, I wonder if in the circumstances, and, and, and uh, Dr. Hancock, I mean, whether you're satisfied for your question to be submitted as printed, uh, members of the committee have all received a copy. Is that, yes, you, I'm getting a thumbs up, Chair, so we'll take the, take the document as submitted if that's, if that's easier for, for the doctor. I, I think so. I think, uh, I, think I saw uh, Dr. Hancock uh, nodding that uh, 
she accepted that. Um, so um, what I will do at this stage, I will um, uh, ask our Director of Public Health whether she would like to um, uh, answer Dr. Han uh, Dr. Hancock's question. Is um, Shade there? Again, Cher, I'm looking down the list of attendees. I do know that Nigel means, and I'm wondering if it's involved. Um, I am. I am here, Paul. Ah, oh, bless you. Okay, I'll yeah. shut up. <laughs> and and I'm happy to answer the question, Councillor Redford. It's question one, Shade. Yes. Do you want me to read out the question first so that everybody can hear it, or just go straight into the answer? Well, everybody should um, should have it in front of them. So uh, I think please go into into the yeah. answer. Great. So um, the support contacts are being offered by the CSW Beacon. My answer is that during the initial pandemic response, uh, local authorities developed strong links with voluntary and community sector and with informal neighbourhood level COVID support groups which were established to support people who have been shielded. We will continue to build on these links to offer people help who are isolating due to testing positive or being in close contact of a case with practical tasks such as shopping. Within Warwickshire, we are planning an engagement session with the neighbourhood level groups to harness their ongoing support for test and trace. And we're also exploring how to secure additional input from community development workers to support community engagement and add extra capacity, particularly in some areas where we know that there have been fewer neighbourhood support groups. Um, I would hope to take you through our outbreak control plan um, during my slot on the agenda, which will hopefully uh, demonstrate okay. explicitly how we will work to support vulnerable groups. Uh, and the intention is that all of the existing schemes will continue for those shielding and extend support to individuals that are currently shielding, individuals that are usually provided with support and care by an individual who now needs to go into self-isolation and um, people who may find it difficult and need extra support. And we continue to work with these agencies who already support homeless communities, vulnerable migrants, and victims of domestic or sexual abuse in order to define the best local solutions for preventing and reducing transmission within this community. So the short answer to that is, we did that at the start of the pandemic. We haven't stopped and we'll continue to provide the support. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. Uh, we're now going on to question two. Uh, from Councillor Jackie Chambers, North Warwickshire Borough Council. Are you there, Jackie? I'm here, Chairman. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Um, so That's fine. Would you like to go ahead and put your question? Thank you very much, Chairman. Yes, my question relates to the provision of, of information from tests which have been carried out through the National Test system of drive-in centres, mobile units and postal home testing kits. Obviously, with the easing of many lockdown measures which were announced yesterday by the Prime Minister, including the halving of the two-metre social distancing rule, I think we're seeking reassurance that there is an ability to identify spikes in community transmission which might arise as a result of these other informal settings such as pubs, hotels and restaurants opening. And these tests, I think they're known as pillar two in the jargon, now amount to more than half the tests which are carried out in the community and would appear to be vital in monitoring what is happening uh, to transmission in the wider community. And the sub-regional briefing paper, which was circulated to members, uh, said that one of the priority actions was to ensure that the results of these tests were returned quickly and in a form which could be used by local public health teams to respond rapidly to local needs and identify outbreaks. So, my question, Chairman, is this. Now that Warwickshire County Council has been selected as a beacon authority to work with national leaders on outbreak control plans, I would like to know what progress has been made in making these test data from the National Test and Trace System available to local public health teams so that they can identify early spikes in wider community tra transmission? How quickly are these test results coming back, including those from home test kits and being returned and made available? And whether the information on these tests is in a format which can and has indeed been used to identify and investigate recent outbreaks in the county. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Shade? Yes, so 
Uh, the first um, part of that question asks what progress has been made in making test data available from the National Test and Trace System. I can assure you that there's a lot of progress that has been made. We now have access to Pillar 2 testing data um, from um, directly from NHS Digital and from Public Health England. This data is um, available at Warwickshire County Council level and at district and borough level, so we know exactly what is happening in relation to Pillar 2 data. Um, test and around times still between one and three days for the Pillar 2 testing, so people are getting their results back sometimes between 24 and 48 hours. The third part of your question asks whether this information has been used to identify and investigate recent outbreaks in the current county. My answer to that is we've had a mixture of um, notification mechanisms for the recent incidents in, in the county. And the reason why I say incidents is that not all of it have been outbreaks. So an incident is defined by Public Health England as a single positive case in a setting. An outbreak is two or more symptomatic or positive cases in a setting. What we've had till date are three workplace incidents that have been reported to us by Public Health England. And um, that means that has come from the National Test and Trace Service. We've had two workplace outbreaks, which you're probably all aware of, in, in, in both in the police, but those were reported directly to us via the police. And then we've had one school outbreak reported to us directly. So multiple other school incidents that have happened uh, have just been symptomatic children who then turned out to be negative, and they've come from the National Test and Trace Service. So it's fair to say that we have had a mixture of notification mechanisms. And as the National Test and Trace Service gains momentum, we will continue to see more from the National Test and Trace Service. What I can say is, however, that because we have excellent relationships with our partners in, in Warwickshire County Council, for example, the relationship with schools, head teachers come directly to us um, once there's a case in a school uh, or once there's a suspected uh, case in a school. And we continue to leverage on these good relationships to pick up um, this incidents before they, they even reach the National Test and Trade Service. Head teachers come directly to us uh, once there's a case in a school uh, or once there's a suspected case. Uh, thank you, Shay. Uh, our next question is uh, from Professor Nick Spencer. Are you there? I think you are. Again, Professor Spencer, you've just muted on your microphone at the moment. I am just... muted, and then uh, yeah, I am muted, and then I muted myself again. Uh, <laughs> sorry, too much clicking. Uh, right. Okay, uh, Professor, well, if you'd like to uh, make your statement and question, please. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank the Council very much, uh, particularly uh, Paul Spencer, uh, no relation, uh, who has been very helpful uh, and um, very courteous in his uh, response. Um, it, this, uh, this, in a way, follows on from um, uh, Councillor Chambers' uh, question. Um, uh, one of the concerns is uh, about um, community-based contact tracing, um, and uh, we have been aware of and in, uh, in contact with colleagues from primary care and public health professionals in Sheffield and Calderdale uh, who've established local community-based contact tracing initiatives uh, which have contributed positively to contact tracing, sensitive to and embedded in local communities. That sensitive to and embedded is actually quite an important concept uh, here. By contrast, as far as we can see in the uh, CSW Beacon Test and Trace Plan, which interestingly appears to have omitted isolated, isolate from its title, uh, tracing of contacts of individuals in the community uh, is being carried out by cold callers recruited by the uh, outsourcing company Circo with no involvement of primary care or community-based tracers. It's our contention that receiving a request uh, to isolate from a trusted GP is far more likely to be heeded. Contact tracing and follow-up to ensure isolation are skilled and sensitive processes and the use of remote callers with no local knowledge and no clear plan to follow up is destined to fail. Support during the period of isolation is a vital part of a successful plan, um, TT and I plan, uh, that is missing from the current plan. So our quest my question is, 
as a group of retired GPs, public health and community doctors and nurses, we are wanting to try to establish a locally based community contact tracing, uh, isolation and support initiative working with primary care practices and trained local volunteers. We'd like to ask the DPH um, to consider meeting with us to discuss how our expertise can be deployed to contribute to a locally sensitive and embedded initiative. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you. Uh, Shay, would you like to come in? Yes. yes. Um, I'd be happy to meet with Professor Spencer and, and colleagues. Uh, I'm definitely happy to meet with yourselves. Well, it, it is useful, for, I think, to describe the local role in, in the Test and Trace programme. So working with Public Health England, our role is to manage complex cases. So the national contact tracers have been put in place to deal with non-complex, straightforward contact tracing. Um, the brief from central government is that local authorities' role is to manage complex cases that are linked with particular settings or outbreaks that need local knowledge and connections to provide solutions, work with national leaders to develop tests and um, outbreak control plans and develop faster approaches to test and trace. Uh, till date, what we have done is used existing um, resources and capacity to deal with outbreaks, working jointly with Public Health England. What I do recognise, and we, we all jointly recognise, is that that capacity may soon become inadequate, and we are intending to use some of the test and trace funding that has come into local government to put in place additional capacity, especially with the easing of lockdown measures. So while it's been pretty straightforward to deal with incidents as they happen because the number of contacts that we've needed to um, contact and, and, and provide information on, on, on isolation has been small. We know that with easing of lockdown and the relaxation of the two meter rule to one meters, we may start to need additional capacity. Um, so the, the, the cases or the incidents that we've had so far have not required the sort of large scale contact tracing uh, because contacts have been limited. We are currently exploring this additional capacity through our local health protection board. So we have a, a local health protection board again, which is one of the acts from central, central government, which meets every Thursday, and uh, which has got membership from the NHS, from our CCGs, from our district and boroughs, uh, environmental health teams, training standards, and a range of academic colleagues as well sit on our local health protection, COVID-19 health protection board. But like I said, I'm happy to meet with Professor Spencer's colleagues to, de to explore how this expertise uh, can, be, can be deployed. Thank, Thank you very you much, Jay. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, the Thank next two questions are actually from uh, Professor Anna Pollard, and I can see her, so I know she's there. Um, so, um, Anna, would you like to kick off with uh, question four? Thank you very much, Chair. Can you hear me? We can. I can. Yes, we can. Yeah. Um, my first question could probably be deferred because it's not COVID direct <clears throat> related directly, although it may be. <clears throat> and that's to do with CCG deficits. Um, <clears throat> so South Warwick's CCG has at the moment a 26 million deficit. And Coventry and Rugby and North Warwick's CCG have a 17.9 million deficit. So the question is, uh, will the um, committee investigate how the CCGs will deal with these deficits? And of course, it may be related to the money being spent on uh, COVID, but I think probably obviously we're concentrating on talking to Dr. Buhler at the moment. So if you can just minute that and deal with it, you know, in the long longer term. <clears throat> the second uh, statement um, and question really underlines what um, Professor Spencer and Council Chambers have been talking about, which is the urgency of uh, getting uh, local uh, testing and tracing. Uh, going, which doesn't depend on the um, national call centre system. And there was actually an article, which is in my question, in the British Medical Journal, saying that local tracers are reaching eight times more um, <clears throat> people than the, the national centre. So basically, what I just want to point out to, to councillors is that um, the Office of National Statistics um, estimated a huge number of cases, 33,000, of COVID between the end of May and 13th of June. Um, but 
The UK government test and trace scheme for England between the same period, roughly, is just below 6,000, which is a tiny proportion. So this is a real worry about the current system not reaching people. And of these just below 6,000 diagnosed cases through the central system, uh, fewer than three quarters were contacted by the NHS test and trace uh, SOCO run contact places, and this has been reported in the media and in the news, new scientists, etc. So, and furthermore, in addition, not everyone contacted by the test and trace was reached quickly enough. So, of course, the, the, the recommendation of SAGE is that 80% should be reached within 24 hours um, for the, the region to make any use to, to reach contact. But in fact, only 75% were contacted within the target of 24 hours, and 8.6% were only contacted after 72 hours, when the chance of an infected person has already spread the virus is very high. So the question is, it's really more of a general question underlying um, what Professor Spencer has been saying is our enthusiasm to help real community-based contact tracing to get going, um, recognising that the complete inadequacy um, of the government system to reach people, considering there are so many more um, than the 33,000 at the time, um, so uh, that's really my question, and you know, Dr. Gula has already said to Professor Spencer that she's willing to meet with us, and I'm really just underlying that. Thank you very much, uh, Professor, for both those questions. Uh, did you want to respond on anything there, Jade? Um, my response is, is similar. I am happy um, to explore um, working with local health protect professionals and volunteers. Um, like I said in, in my previous answer, um, our response and, and our responsibility in relation to test and trace has been to deal with uh, complex situations. Um, our outbreak control plan centred on the seven themes which we were given as a break from cent central government. So complex issues that cannot be re resolved by the regional public health England health protection teams, outbreaks that need on the ground response and supporting vulnerable people to self-isolate. Um, we have not required a sort of large-scale contact tracing, uh, mainly because, like I said, contacts have been limited. This will potentially change as the easing of lockdown um, um, expands. And we, like I said, we have our local health protection board where we have a range of professionals that already sit on it. We've got money that's coming to us, which we are going to use to expand our capacity. But having said all of that, I am open to suggestions from the committee, from Professor Pollard as well, um, Professor Spence and Dr. Pollard, to explore what additional capacity we might potentially be able to bring in. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. Um, OK, we're going on to question six, uh, which is from Dr. Gordon Avery. I think he might be having a few problems, I understand. Are you there, Dr. Avery? Similar question. Shay, would you would you like to comment in uh, Dr. Avery? I think um, uh, is having problems communicating. So we've got this question written down. All members have got it. W would you like to make a comment on that on that one? Are you with me, Shay? Chair, can you hear me? I can. I just had a I just had an internet drop out. I'm sorry. I don't know if it's starting to come back or not. I think Shay might have had one as well. Yeah, I just I, I just, had one. As well. Yeah. That's so. That's okay, Shay. Shay, are you there? I am here. Yeah, I'm back now. But I've just turned up my video. Okay. Twenty minutes on the table. All right. So uh, we're on question six. Uh, Dr. Avery isn't uh, able to be with us at the moment. Well, he is, but he's um, having uh, communication problems. So would you would you like to comment on his question? Yes, his question is quite similar to yes. the question yeah. asked by Professor um, Pollard and, and Professor Spencer. 
Uh, and my answer is, is still the same. Uh, this is what our role is in local government. This is what we've been asked to do, and that's what we've been doing. We've been using existing capacity and resources, but we recognize that that may soon become inadequate, and I am willing to explore the offer from Dr. Avery. Okay, thank you very much for that. Thank you. Question seven we have is from uh, Mr. Martin Jew. Drew. Are you there, Mr. Drew? Yeah, can you hear me? I, I can, yes. Would you like to put your um, statement and question, please? Thanks very much, Chair, and uh, good morning, everybody. This is about the local imp the importance of primary care in handling the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, yes. There is an established statutory locally based public health system for tackling notifiable diseases. GPs are pivotal in this process. Patients trust and their GPs knowledge of health history are very important in diagnosis. GPs are also experienced in cooperating with local public health and other local agencies. A patient with symptoms contacts their GP. If a notifiable disease is suspected, GP tests, sends, their, sends it to the local public health lab, advises the patient to isolate, and GP notifies public health. Test results are returned within 24 hours. If confirmed, health, public health organises traces to track patients and contacts in the local area. This tried, tested and trusted system involves close cooperation and local knowledge. It has been successfully used widely throughout Europe. However, in the case of COVID-19, the government sidelined this legal process with a centralised, fragmented, unevaluated system. GPs are bypassed because NHS 111 and testing centres did not notify GPs of suspected cases. GPs weren't allowed to test, so confirmed cases were not recorded. Furthermore, many results from independent testing companies and lighthouse laboratories went missing and many swab tests were false negative due to poor tester training. Until recently, no testing was done in the community. All tests were confined to hospitals. This is probably a major contributory factor to the huge number of excess tests and the catastrophic toll in care homes. Reliable local testing together with effective use of tracing data and are key. The advent of autumn and winter months will be a critical time if there is a second COVID wave, together with the usual increase in flu cases. Expert diagnosis by GPs and swab samples taken by trained nurses is vitally important to ensure high quality results compared with those produced by the likes of Deloitte or home tester kits. GPs play a role in the the GPs play no role in the commentary, so the whole Warwickshire local pilot beacon programme for test and trace. They should be brought in. GPs and local public health need to take control and should be funded accordingly. There are willing, retired professionals and many of the 7,000 Warwick Leamington Mutual Aid volunteers should be deployed for community contact tracing. My question, and I know I've got two now because I added an extra one, will the direct, Director of Public Health and HOSC investigate how GPs can be brought into the COVID-19 response as they should have been in the first place? And the second question, are Warwickshire GPs receiving, receiving COVID-19 antigen test results? If not, can the Director of Public Health uh, do about this? What can you do about this? Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, Shade? Yeah. So the first part of that question is whether we will investigate how GPs can be brought into the response. Absolutely, yes. Um, we're doing a lot of work to support local contact tracing and I'm willing to look at how we work more effectively with GPs. One suggestion that has come in uh, to us is how we can use GPs for testing uh, because that's one of the asks uh, within our local con outbreak control plan and that is one of the specific asks from central government to develop and mobilise and deploy local testing capacity. So we are currently uh, producing an options appraisal for the different testing options available to us. Bearing in mind that GPs are there and they're, they're exist, they, they are a, a potentially untapped resource for testing within the community. So that is one option that we're considering. Um, in, in terms of whether or not GPs are receiving antigen test results, I believe that there are plans to ensure that test results are made available, uh, but they may not be yet. But I am happy to make an open offer to, to discuss how GPs can be sensibly brought in. Recognising, however, that oh, there are so many pressures on, on primary care and these pressures will start to ramp up as things open up and other services start to mobilise and we start to recognise the real health impact of, of the pandemic. So I, I think 
My interpretation of the model for uh, test and trace is that it has been specifically designed to reduce burden on GPs from testing. Um, and yes, it, it is up to us to explore how we can potentially do that. And like I said, one of the options we're currently considering is whether to uh, procure and, and commission GPs to deliver a, a locally based testing service. But I'm happy to, to pick up on this conversation and explore how that, that and other, other potential options might work. Thank you very much, Jay, for that. Um, members, uh, there was one further question which um, was received, uh, but it uh, came outside of the notification uh, requirements. Uh, but we are, we, we, it has been forwarded to officers um, for a um, response. Um, so, just to thank, really, all members of the public uh, who have uh, contributed uh, today, um, it, it is um, uh, very good news, actually, to, to have so many member, members of the public actually taking part in our um, uh, committee work. Um, Professor Anna Pollitt is a, is a regular uh, contributor um, to our meetings, um, but um, you know to have so many people interested. I know that, of course, the current uh, COVID nineteen uh, pandemic is is live and very much a uh, big issue. But even so, um, to have um, the number of questions uh, put forward by you is uh, is welcome. I hope that you will. Um, perhaps take part in our further meetings. It would be good to hear um, from a good cross-section of the public. So thank you all very much um, for participating uh, this morning. Uh, we go on to item three. Um, is, is Les with us today yet? Chair, I've not uh, seen him on the, um, the the list of those attending at the moment. I do know he had a medical appointment himself and he said okay. he would be a little late. Whether it's worth it, if members are willing to perhaps just pop that item later onto the agenda so we can deal with it then, if that's helpful. I'll, I'll just delay that one to the end to see whether um, Les gets back from his uh, hospital appointment. So we'll, we'll go on to number four, um, which is... Um, uh, our uh, COVID recovery approach, um, and I think we I think we might have. Uh, is it Geraint? Oh no, Nigel! I see you there. Are you going to kick off, Nigel? Yeah, I'm going to kick off, Chair, if I may. Um, this is a um, a kind of two-part report, really. So the, the pla it sets out the proposed approach to recovery, uh, and it's an opportunity for for the committee to input ahead of a um, recovery plan which is going to uh, cabinet in September. Uh, it also follows on from the cabinet report that, um, from the last meeting. So, so part one of the report really is a reflection of some of the work of the past three months during the height of the pandemic. I am not going to go through every um, bullet point in the list in 3.2 because I think members can read that. I did want to kind of um, point out really that um, public health of, of have obviously been uh, at the heart of our response to the pandemic, offering expertise, advice, support um, within the council and beyond across the, the, um, the county and the sub-region, developing guidance, developing briefings. Um, they played a very specific role around supporting the housing of rough sleepers, uh, you've heard a lot about the National uh, Test and Trace uh, program already, so I'm not going to say anything about that. Uh, clearly, they've been working with partners around infection prevention and control measures, um, both dealing with current ones and preventing future ones. And they're, they're very well linked into to the information for our recovery planning, because all of our recovery across the council requires uh, their expertise. Um, I also wanted to mention some of the, um, what is described here as speedy mobilisation. I think it was almost overnight move of adult social care for uh, seven day working to ensure that we had continual support for customers. Um, flag up the use of video and telephone meetings where we haven't been able to do face to face work. 
uh, strengthening of hospital discharge programs, and I'm going to say a little bit more, more about that, and actually maintaining services really throughout the pandemic for vulnerable people. And, and I finally wanted to mention the, the commissioned uh, arrangements, so ensuring that all of our commissioned services uh, were adapted uh, to, to operate in the best way that they could in this environment. Um, huge amount of work uh, to support care homes and our dom care providers and, and the creation of our uh, care home resilience plan which was very well received by um, a wide range of partners um, through an evaluation program. Um, I talked about discharge and I specifically wanted to mention the temporary isolation beds that we've set up so that customers, uh, patients who are discharged from hospital don't go straight into a care home or into a dom care service, but actually have the opportunity to be in a, a, an, an interim facility, if you like, for isolation to stop discharges of uh, COVID positive people into hospital, uh, sorry, from hospital into care homes. And then I wanted to flag up that some of our other services, domestic abuse, substance misuse, suicide prevention, etc., health service, uh, sexual health services, have been operating and are creating in a variety of different ways. So I think the looking back part, I think those are some of the highlights, but as I said, you have far more detail than that. In terms of the cabinet paper that's attached, I did want to flag up uh, the principles in paragraph 2.2. Uh, and I think this is very much about, those recovery principles are very much about seeking to, to use what we've learned and some of the innovation, the creativity, the flexibility uh, that's been developed in response to the pandemic to ensure we continue with those during uh, recovery. Uh, I wanted to flag up that our recovery is operating at a range of levels and for the specific uh, national, sub-regional, across the county and locally. And I think specifically for this uh, committee to point out that we are very closely engaged with our health partners and our, uh, the health and care partnership around ensuring that we, we join up our recovery um, between the council and our health providers and of course the voluntary and community sector. Uh, and then finally I wanted to mention just the, the phasing I suppose. So the period we're in at the moment is what we're describing as a foundation stage is very much about reinstating, standing up those services that we can do. The next stage is a much more consolidating period um, and then there is the long-term recovery period that comes beyond that and is probably from the next financial year, really. Um, obviously, there are a number of uh, cross-party working groups that are being established, and they are briefly uh, mentioned in 3.2, um, which also give all members or a range of members an opportunity to feed in. So I think that's probably as much as I wanted to say, Chair, if... Um, uh, I'm happy to take any questions or comments uh, from colleagues and from members if they have if they have any. Thank you, Nigel. Could I could I just ask you um, uh, one question? Um, in the media, of course, we've had a, a lot of uh, criticisms about uh, um, responses given to care homes. Could you could you just give give a, a short term briefing? on how we have communicated with our um, care homes and responded to any difficulties? Yeah, of course. So um, I don't have a full list in front of me. Uh, there, there is a, a really detailed list on the website and I would uh, draw members' attention to it. Uh, so the uh, Care Home Resilience Plan, as it is described, uh, is published on the website and I, I'd be happy uh, or perhaps I'll ask Paul if he'd send out a link afterwards so that members can have a look at that at that plan. Ironically, uh, although it's described as a care home resilience plan, much of it is a summary of what action we've taken already um, because it was it was designed on a template sent to us uh, by central government. Um, but in, in essence, so we started with um, right at the beginning of the pandemic, we created a separate microsite uh, attached on our website for providers to bring together all the information, all the communications for them, so they had everything that they they needed in one place. We also established a, an immediate um, system for support around PPE, around personal protective equipment, um, which 
meant that we were able to, while we weren't able to supply all PPE to providers and we encouraged them to continue to use their existing routes, we were able to give emergency supplies to any provider who needed it in order to enable them to access it if ever they, they came close to running out. So anyone who had less than three days supply could contact us and we would supply them with PPE. We have never been unable to meet the needs if it's things that, that are appropriate for us to, to be providing. Um, so throughout that, we've been able to respond to every request. Um, I understand we've actually distributed over a million items of PPE to the sector during the course of the pandemic. Um, the other thing that we did quite quickly was to establish a, um, a workforce recruitment plan. So effectively, we were able to recruit uh, centrally staff to support care homes, to work in care homes uh, and uh, dom care providers across the county um, to do rapid training and rapid DPS, uh, DPS checking for them so that they were able to get to work very quickly. And I think the last time I looked, we'd, we'd recruited over 100 extra staff providers uh, through that route. I, I suspect it's, it's considerably more than that now. Um, and, and I suppose the final bit that I wanted to say is, is about the financial offer. So we wrote to care home providers very early on to say that we would meet all additional costs of the COVID pandemic for our providers during the course of the um, pandemic. So any additional costs, whether it was workforce costs, PPE costs, infection control costs, whatever they might be, um, directly related to um, our providers, we would meet those costs. Um, subsequently, we had the... Um, Infection Control Fund, um, which was um, designed to be for 75% of it to go out to providers directly. So in, in terms, we passported that directly to providers. Um, that came into us on a Friday. Um, we went through the various processes and arrangements, and it was in providers' bank accounts by the following Friday. So I think probably quicker than than, than almost anywhere in the country, really, the, the money was passported straight out. I know at the time of the plan, um, we had provided just over £4.1 million pounds worth of uh, direct uh, funding support to providers. That will, of course, have gone up since then. Uh, and there will be an update at the end of this month, which will cover uh, June. We're also due to distribute a second tranche of the Infection Control Fund as soon as we receive it, because we haven't had the money yet, um, uh, beginning of July, which will be another 2.7 million to providers at that point. Um, as I said, it's not everything, but <laughs> hopefully that's a fairly um, reasonable overview for the committee. No, I, <coughs> thank you, Nigel. I think really from, um, from the county, um, it's been a good response and uh, uh, obviously our care homes um, will, will be thankful that we, the, the county has responded um, so quickly to them. Now I've got um, I've got three um, uh, members for questions. I've got uh, Keith, Helen, and Margaret. So I'll kick off with Keith. Thank you very much, Chair. The um, intermediate place for people to be discharged from hospital rather than putting them straight back into care homes is a really good idea. And obviously, there's been some talk on social media about the George Elliot. Um, and people saying people are being shipped out of there. I think people may be misunderstanding, and it might be some cases of people going into this intermediate um, stand down area. Can you give us an idea of how many are going from the George Elliot into this stand down area, and if any are actually then going back the other way? Thank you, Chair. Uh, so, my understanding is to date. I think all of the uh, people who've been discharged through those arrangements have come from the George Elliot. Uh, certainly the vast majority of them have, um, and none, as far as I'm aware, have gone the, back the other way. A number of them have been now safely discharged, um, having completed their isolation period. Just to have an idea what number that is? I don't, I, I don't have the number, but I can share it afterwards. Okay, Keith. Okay, uh, Helen. 
Thanks, Chair. Yeah, I actually put my, my hand back down. Oh. I'm going to wait till the. Um, can you can you hear me all right? Yes, I'm fine. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to wait till the next item, the work program, to raise the points that I want to raise. So sorry about that. That's fine. That's fine. That's fine. No problem. Margaret. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I'd just like to say that I'm being really impressed by the work that's been going on during this crisis at, at the county. I think they've done an excellent job, so uh, well done to everybody. Um, I was just wondering about the sustainability of some of the things that we've done into the future, which we hope will be normal soon, uh, normal working eventually. And, and in particular, um, what we did for homeless people and, and how much of that can be carried forward and also the way we we have been discharging patients from hospital very quickly, um, sometimes into the settings you've just described, sometimes back to home, and, and whether that's a process now that's embedded that will carry us forward. And, and just uh, on my final point, uh, Nigel, you mentioned um, standing up services as soon as possible. I just wondered, in the context of our committee, which services are urgent and what the priorities are to get stood up again? that haven't been as operable as they might have been during this crisis. Thank you. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll try and remember all of those. Um, um, if I start with hospital discharge, um, I, I think that we have, A, benefited hugely from the work that's gone on over the last couple of years around kind of reducing uh, discharge times. So I think we... We took an approach from the start that we weren't going to have this as a kind of competition between us and the NHS and pass responsibilities back and forward, that our target would be to reduce the overall system delays rather than NHS delays or social care delays. And I think some of that, well, I know some of that relation, the relationships that were developed during that have been really helpful during this period. I have to say that those relationships have improved hugely during the, the pandemic as well. Um, I, I think particularly with, with our community health provider, um, who are the most closely kind of engaged, so, so that will be swift across the county. Uh, I think our community services have been really well engaged with social care services, uh, and we definitely don't want to lose any of that. So some of the joint working protocol systems and things, we're really keen, and in fact, some of the, um, some of the managers have started to get together now to, to plan uh, a recovery together, if you like, for those arrangements. Um, there, there are um, the one complexity about discharge is that during a pandemic, we're operating under different hospital discharge guidance, and one of the things that we're hoping is that the national guidance will remain much closer to the pandemic guidance than to the pre-pandemic guidance, if you like, because actually it is better; it facilitates better discharge. Um, so I think that's the one thing probably uh, that we, we'd like to push central government on, really. Um, in terms of the homelessness, I, I, I absolutely agree. There's been some fantastic work uh, across the districts and boroughs and our public health colleagues who have been working to support people. Um, we, we, are to some, we would like, of course, to do what we can to continue that and to make sure that, that those systems work as well. We are expecting imminently announcements around funding and arrangements for that, again, from central government. So I think probably once we've got those, we'll be able to provide a further update on terms of what we are able to do moving forward. Um, and then in terms of, in terms of prioritisation, um, I think there are well, there are a few things. I mean, in terms, of, it's mainly around our commissioned services at this stage. The one that is, is is most pressing for me, I think, at the moment, is is around respite, uh, particularly around adults with disabilities, and actually that would be true for children with disabilities too, where clearly it's quite a difficult thing to step up um, uh, because it is a very personal kind of care. Uh, situation, but that's certainly one that there, there is pressure from uh, the public around. Um, our hospital teams, etc., have operated throughout, so we don't need to, to focus on those. Uh, domestic abuse has been an issue for us right the way through. 
Uh, we've tried to, to ensure that we have a suitable online offer and some face-to-face -face kind of office offers. And I think that, again, is a, is a priority for us to make sure that we've got as much face-to-face -face support as we can get as quickly as, as we can do that. Um, and then there are a whole host of other services like uh, sexual health services, which have operated. Many, many of the services are, are about, they've operated, they've continued to do things, they've worked in a virtual way or an online way, and it's making them face-to-face -face again where we possibly can, that I think is, is probably the priority at the moment. Chairman, can I just say thank you very much for that. And the, the point about the government um, guidance on discharge, I wonder if there's anything that this committee can do to support um, the view that we need to continue with the guidance that's currently effective. So uh, I'll just leave it with the chairman to see whether we can send a letter or whatever Nigel thinks might be helpful. That'd be really helpful, thank you. Okay, yes, we'll, we'll take that on board, uh, Margaret. Uh, John? Thank you, Chair. Yeah, um, can I echo the comments about staff because um, many staff are having to do their jobs in different ways and of course many staff are having to do different jobs and rising to the challenge and the difficulties I don't think can be underestimated for any of us. Um, I, I've got two questions actually. The first one is an immediate one because I, I think the areas where we're running into problems are things that are actually outside of the remit of the County Council. Um, you know, we've supplied PPE to care homes, but supplying PPE to dentists is, has not been our job. And I think this relationship with um, other statutory and private sector is causing us some difficulty. And my, my first question is the immediate one about um, pubs and restaurants reopening and at the same time as many children are not going to school yeah. and we need to work with the district and borough councils and with the private sector to manage this. But from a health point of view, when pubs and restaurants reopen, for us as local councillors, working with the private sector to get our businesses reopened and with traffic control measures in place, what would be the priority for us as local councillors working with other stakeholders outside of the county council in order to avoid a, a mass reinfection? Hmm. <laughs> I might ask the director of public health to comment <laughs> um, um, because I think it's really before before I do it, I'll give her time to think um, uh, before we do because I think I think I did want to reassure you first of all that we are working very closely with districts and boroughs and with businesses uh, um, in all of these arrangements coming forward. So we have uh, weekly engagement um, with the leaders and chief execs um, of the districts and boroughs through a, a shared recovery uh, approach. Um, and items such as um, uh, town centre planning, for example, and what the implications of that are very much on the agenda. Um, in the uh, recovery plan which went to cabinet i think the work streams haven't i can't look at you all and look at the papers at the same time uh, i think the work streams are set out and cover up some of those arrangements which are um uh, i don't know if they are or not sorry let me pause while i check yeah um so those yeah so in appendix b the map that sets out the economy community and well-being uh elements of the recovery those are being developed and taken forward jointly with the districts and boroughs so they are closely involved in that kind of uh, planning in terms of the priorities for supporting um the, the the easing of lockdown i don't know if Shade does have anything she'd like to kind of comment on yes yeah, so um my answer to that would be that we have made it repeatedly clear and explicit that it doesn't matter that lockdown is being eased. We will not abandon the messages that have worked so well from the start of the pandemic, which is about social distancing as much as we can, physical distancing, um, enhanced hygiene, especially within high risk settings, uh, hand washing. Um, working with specific settings like we've done, including um, religious places of worship, 
um, supermarkets, a range of workplace settings. We will not abandon that. Uh, and that's the key for me in preventing a second wave. If I have, if I have the opportunity to take you through a, a presentation which I delivered last week to our member-led board, there is a clear priority within our outbreak control plan that is prevention. That has got six elements to it. So physical and organizational measures, creating physically distanced environments, infection control measures, especially in key high-risk settings, uh, addressing inequalities. We've all seen the reports in the media about the relationship between BAME and COVID. Uh, using enforcement as prevention and making sure that we communicate, communicate as much as we can and focusing on longer term approaches to embed these ways of working into, into the future, bearing in mind that COVID is not a, a uh, an acute problem, it's a slow burn, it's a long term issue that we will that will be with us for a very long time. So that's that really is my answer to that question. We cannot relax and we continue to make sure that whatever it is that we're doing, whatever messages we are putting out there, uh, prevention underscores everything that we do. Thank you. And John, you, you had a second I question. To say that that's very helpful because we've got pubs and restaurants reopening on Saturday week and I have to talk to the private sector about the traffic measures and the distancing and wider pavements and cycle lanes. And obviously this is really difficult because it's people's livelihoods and the viability of the business. And it's really urgent because it will happen on Saturday week and the reopening of our present businesses is, um, well, it's a lot of hard work for a lot of people. But my second question is about the longer term because um, when I joined the Health and Wellbeing Board in 2017, I looked at the figures for life expectancy in the UK and found that life expectancy was fairly constant up to 1900. It then increased and increasingly increased up to 2010 and then levelled off. And when I talked to John Linnan and the Public Health Warwickshire staff, they pointed out that there had been an outbreak of an infectious disease five years ago in the winter of 2014-15 and that partly explained the levelling off of life expectancy and uh, not really though and looking at the documents we've had for this meeting um, reducing inequalities seems to be a key thing well, what i'm thinking is this virus is not going away it hasn't gone away is the new normal that we have to work in the long term with infectious diseases and is the priority for the council for the long term and closing the gap between rich and poor and reducing inequalities. Thank you, John. I'll bring you shade. For yeah, um, the, it's a priority. Um, so when I first came into post, my there's, there's a requirement, a statutory obligation on, on, on direct public health to produce a direct public health report. And um, before COVID, that work had already started. And my um, selection of a, of a topic or focus area was health inequalities. My intention was to shine a light on health inequalities across Warwickshire. Uh, bearing in mind the differences between the north and the south, uh, there's a clear north and south divide in the, in the county. What COVID has done is make it clear that this sort of work and this sort of expose of, of this the divide or, or the, the health inequalities within the county is even more important. Because COVID is yet another symptom of the clear differences in health and health outcomes between those at the bottom of the social scale and those at, at, at the top of the of the social scale. So that remains a priority. And what I've agreed with my team going forward is that that's my, my direct public health annual report will still be focused on, on health inequalities, but will be anchored by COVID and what we've observed in terms of the differences in death rates among groups, knowing what we know about COVID and its relationship with low socioeconomic status. The other issue you raised about life expectancy and leveling off. Um, there is also some reasons why that has happened, and there was a research published about two years ago that looked at the impact on, on uh, of all sorts of measures on life expectancy. They are all um, correlations, and it's difficult to establish causation. So it is difficult to say this is exactly what has caused that leveling off. But there are a number of factors that can be attributed to it, uh, and I, I don't want to go into detail into that here now. But what I can say is that health inequalities remain a priority. It is clearly explicit in our agri-control plan, which is in its um, 
near final stages now, which will be shared with everybody. Um, the deadline for production is the 30th of June. Once that is uh, passed, the output control plan will be in the public domain. It is clear, it is explicit. We have groups that are identified within our plan that we need to target. And yes, I can just give you that assurance that that is a priority for us. Thank you very much, Arde. Um, <clears throat> I've still got two, two more questions, questioners. Uh, Jerry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, can I thank Sade also for that? And I look forward to the public health report. Uh, and I've probably still got an old one from about 15 years ago where we were talking about the same issues in Warwickshire, if not 20 years ago when I got first, first onto the County Council. So it would be interesting to see how COVID actually anchors uh, the particular changes in the political debate that takes place within Warwickshire and the North-South divide. So um, uh, thank you for that. Um, the, the, the point really was coming back to residential care homes. Um, Warwickshire has done better than quite a lot of other areas, quite clearly. Uh, there were some spikes which uh, started happening in some care homes, and I think the county actually uh, did well and, and got in there and helped to support those particular care homes. So thank you uh, for that. Prior to all of this, though, we were coming into looking at the sustainability and the economic model of care homes, domiciliary care uh, and residential and nursing care within Warwickshire and that long-term sustainability. And of course, sitting behind this now as to whether some of those care homes will actually look forward and actually just pack their bags and, and go out to the market and whether they continue. So I'm, I'm hoping that within the cabinet working groups and beyond, whether we can actually ramp up that work and accelerate it because um, I have some particular fears around that. And can I thank Nigel as well for the, the point that he made about respite. And I, uh, as he knows, dur during the process, have picked up increasing amounts of um, pressures coming from people uh, of all ages. Um, and some of them are quite sad stories where people were actually literally on the verge of, of even like getting knives out and not doing the right thing, but they were actually um, through those telephone calls. And I think the county did what it could do, but actually those people are still in their homes and they're still looking after either their mothers or sons, daughters or whatever. And I know there's a desperate need uh, to try and get that out. Now, whether we can do something further with social prescribing and the local support groups and actually ramp up some of the, the advice and help coming through their support groups. I know the ones in our areas are doing regular phone-ins and that seems to have alleviated the position uh, and helped, but, it, but, it, but it, I think that just needs to be accelerated as well. And I hope that the cabinet working groups can move that. But respite is a massive key issue for mental health and uh, I'm, I'm surprised that some you know, abuse side has not really gone on, which we'll never know about quite clearly, but that is, needs to be accelerated. But the sustainability of care homes, we need to get that sorted. Yeah, Chair, if I, if I could respond. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so first of all, I agree with everything you said about respite. It is really important, and as soon as we can, we can do it, we, we will. Uh, and as soon as we can do it safely, will it is absolutely a priority. Um, in terms of care homes, I also agree with, with Jerry. It is um, currently probably the number one recovery priority for our social care commissioning teams is the sustainability of care homes. Um, I, we don't know at this stage what... Um, the, the public attitude to going into a care home or a nursing home will be moving forward. Um, I, I think there is a recognition that there may be nervousness about it uh, because, because of the situation that's happened. Uh, vacancy rates currently are higher than we would normally see and um, we don't know how long that will go on. Uh, clearly there is national work going on and ADAS, uh, the Association of Directors of Adult Social Services, uh, are very closely um, engaging with government about what we can do to help support sustainability. Um, but, but I think uh, Jerry's right there in both terms of our work and in terms of those member groups, making sure that we can do everything we can to support the market is really important um, because what we can't do is afford to lose them. Thank you, Nigel. Thank you, thank you, Jerry. I think the, uh, you made some good points there. Thank, thank you very you. much. Um, I've got one more uh, to speak, uh, Chris Bain. 
Yeah, thank, thank you. Can, can you hear me all right, yeah? Uh, yeah, we've got yeah. you. Thank you. I like uh, the balloons. You like the balloons? Yeah, yeah, like you. It's a big improvement on my flat, I can tell you. <laughs> uh, the, I mean, I, the, the discussion on inequalities is a really important one. Um, because the World Health Organization says that inequality is the main driver of the pandemic. And when you look at some of the public health guidance in, in certain social circumstances, it's easier to apply than it is in others. So if you're living in a flat with six other people, it's quite difficult to get the social distancing and all the other protocols correct. Um, so I think that there is an issue there about inequality and, and it will play itself out in time. Um, but the main point I wanted to make really was about um, the discussion earlier about homelessness. And as people will know, we have a, um, a homeless project um, in Healthwatch. And, and what we've noticed over the, since the outbreak of the pandemic is that primary care, and in particular general practice, has taken a more flexible view towards um, homelessness and the ability of homeless people to register at practices. And what I wouldn't like to see is that greater flexibility lost once the pandemic has, has taken its course and we move properly out of lockdown. I think the new flexibilities that have come in place that we've been asking for for a couple of years now, I'd like to see those stay in place because now we have um, um, very clear examples of how that uh, new flexibility is practical and can actually improve care for people who are homeless. So I'd like to... Um, this committee to keep an eye on those new flexibilities to ensure that they stay in place once the pandemic has, has run its course. Thank uh, you for that, Chris. Uh, Nigel, did you want to respond? I, I mean, I would say that I agree with, with Chris. Yeah. That would be really helpful. I don't know if we've got anyone from the CCDs on the call today either uh, who, might, who might want to comment on primary care. I've no idea. Um. Yes, I'm on the call, um, Nigel. Nigel. Just met, so. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on the list, I'm the participants list. Um, I, I say I welcome the comments from Chris, and uh, he's absolutely right. We have uh, been talking about uh, this issue for a, for a couple of years, and uh, the, the COVID uh, pandemic uh, has really helped uh, on this front. I think that we do need to try and keep this up afterwards. So, very happy to have a conversation with him about how we might, how the best way we might go about doing that from his perspective. So, happy to have that chat, uh, Chris. That would be great. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that, Chris. I, I think also um, it's an item that uh, we can follow up perhaps on our, in our work programme um, or some uh, regular updates on briefing notes. So um, I'll follow that one up as well. Uh, I haven't got any more questions um, flagged up. Um, so if there are no more, then um, if we could go to the recommendations, um, one and two, are, are they um, are they approved, generally approved? Non-show of hands will, will indicate that uh, approved. Okay. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. Um, I think we'll go straight, as, as I can see, Sade... Um, uh, smiling there. I, I think we'll go straight on to um, uh, the next item, um, which is the, um, uh, what's it called, task and uh, test and trace, trace and isolate uh, program. Uh, and then I have noticed that Les um, has booked back in, so we'll, we'll have his session if, if you've got any, if the members have got any questions for the portfolio holder um, after Sade has um, completed uh, item five. Okay, can everybody see my screen? Uh, I can, yes. Okay, so I've just shared um, the, the presentation that I delivered to the uh, member engagement board last week, and this provides detail of the test and trace program um, locally. We've dropped the track, so it's just test and trace, um, and tells, hopefully provides a flavor of, of what we're doing, where we are, and um, how things are progressing. So the aim of the, of the plan is, is twofold. The first is to reduce the number of new community cases of COVID-19 to zero. 
and to reduce the impact of the virus on our most vulnerable groups, which ties in with a lot of the conversation that's already happened today in relation to ensuring that health inequalities is, is a running theme in, in, in the plan. We have eight priorities in our plan. The first is around community engagement to build trust and participation. And um, this, the, the choice of this as the first is, emerged from a, a conversation with um, leaders from Coventry and Solid Hall and wider partners and stakeholders who agrees that the core of test and trace really it relies on public participation. You can't do test and trace if people are not going to uh, request for a test when they are uh, feel when they feel unwell, when they have symptoms, or if people are not going to self isolate when they've been asked to. So the the earlier we start to communicate with our communities and build trust, the better. We have a, pr a priority around prevention of infection, and I've talked about that already. Making sure that our high risk settings are supported with um, uh, understanding the principles of enhanced cleaning and reducing the risk of transmission, supporting our vulnerable people, developing and mobilizing local testing capacity, um, contact tracing, bringing together all the data and uh, deployment of capabilities, especially when we need to use enforcement. There was a lot of questions today that asked about what we're doing in relation to setting up a local contact tracing service. And this, hopefully this slide um, describes exactly where we sit and how we slot in into the National Test and Trace program. So national contact tracing is high volume, low complexity cases. So the type that's been that ca that's carried out by the national contact tracers, 25,000 odd of them ha have been um, recruited to carry out national contact tracing. And they are called, um, described as level three call handlers. So level two are uh, professional contact tracers who uh, receive escalations from level three. When level three contact tracers can't deal with it, they, they, they escalate to level two. We are sitting at level one, and we are meant to deal with complex cases working in conjunction with Public Health England and solving or, or managing outbreaks that need local knowledge and, and connections. We received some money from the Department of Health and Social Care, you're probably all aware, 300 million, and the allocations have come through per local authority. 11 local authorities have been selected to work as beacon um, sites, and um, Warwickshire, Coventry, and Solihull are the only ones in the West Midlands. This um, slide is probably out of date now because the numbers are slightly different, but what it just shows is that um, numbers probably do not tell you the real picture. What you need to look at is the rate per 100,000, and the rate on that slide tells us that Solihull has the highest rates um, within the beacon. So what we've done is um, produce sub-regional arrangements. Now, sub-regional arrangements recognises the role of different partners within Coventry, Solihull and Warwickshire. This is a busy slide and I'm happy to share this presentation because I've delivered it at a range of um, meetings and forums already. Um, we have, uh, we've been asked to develop clear governance arrangements. Now, the way our governance works is that we have a joint Coventry, Solihull and Warwickshire um, test and trace sub-regional advisory board, which has as members the leaders from across the three local authorities, Monica as chief exec of the lead local authority. So Warwickshire County Council is the lead local authority for this work. Um, Public Health England, myself as lead DPH for the work and an NHS representative. Underneath this sub-regional advisory board sits our member-led engagement board, which is chaired by Les and uh, brings together um, members uh, and um, some key um, stakeholders from our districts and boroughs. Underneath that sits the local COVID-19 Health Protection Board, which is chaired by me. And uh, I alluded to that earlier on, that brings together colleagues from the NHS, our CCG, our district and borough environmental health colleagues, trading standards, academic colleagues as well. And each of these boards have um, different functions. Within Warwickshire, that's our governance structure, so we've got our test and trace advisory board, we've got our member engagement board, it's got shadow written in it now. By the end of June, it will no longer operate in shadow form. We've had our first meeting on the 16th, we have a next, uh, another meeting on the 29th, which will be in public. And then underneath that is the Warwickshire COVID Health Protection Board, which is chaired by me and leads on all the operational elements of delivering the, the outbreak response or the local test and trace response. So just a bit more detail about our eight priorities. I've talked about the importance of community engagement to build trust and participation. We've developed a range of media protocols. The yes, importance of, of community engagement and communication is, is becoming more and more uh, stark as we move into responding to small incidents. You've probably heard 
uh, in the news, some of what's happened with um, Jajenet Hospital, some of what's happened with the police outbreak, it's just brought home the point that we absolutely need to be clear in our comms um, and, and engagement with, with communi communities and our partners. I've talked about prevention as a key part of our outbreak control plan and how it's got six different domains to it. I've, I've talked about that already, so I won't go into too much detail. But we recognize that, especially with easing of lockdown and the relaxation of the two meter to one meter rule, um, it, prevention is absolutely critical. The, the, the better we can do prevention, the, the easier it will be to bring down the numbers and hopefully eradicate um, COVID-19. It talks about high-risk settings of communities. There's a recognition within the uh, plan that care settings, schools, workplace, certain healthcare settings, homelessness, um, um, settings used by people, um, rough sleeping and homeless people, represent high-risk settings. The beauty of this plan, and I've said this in, in previous meetings, is that we are, we, we've, we've produced a plan while working on the plan. So we are in response mode, we're dealing with these incidents as they, as they happen, and we've put into, into the plan key learning. So our plan is not entirely based on theory, it's based on what we have learned and what we've seen has worked. I've talked about vulnerable people as well because there was a question that came from the public around how we would continue to support vulnerable people. We've done that and we'll just build on that and, and continue the good work that we've done, working with a range of agencies who already support these communities. Testing capacity, absolutely critical to our plan. So uh, we've had the opportunity to explore how we might potentially deploy that this week, working with Nuneaton and Bedworth uh, and looking to see whether we can deploy very quickly a mobile testing unit to that part of the county. Um, we've, we're working with sub-regional colleagues to, to, to ensure that there's mutual aid when we need testing. But as and when we go along, we're responding uh, locally to outbreaks as they, as they occur. Contact tracing, uh, we've been asked a lot of questions about this already. We are working uh, and, and dealing with high-risk um, complex settings, so healthcare schools, homeless communities. We've dealt with a number of school incidents, uh, a number of workplace outbreaks as well, and we continue to use our existing capacity. I've talked about the, the recognition that we might need to expand this capacity as lockdown eases and the potential for a bigger pool of contacts starts to emerge, we might need to expand this capacity. And I, I did say that I will take up the offer that's come from a range of um, people, Professor Spencer and colleagues, to explore how we could potentially do this. That just gives a summary of the National Test and Trace Service and the ask from, from central government in terms of what we're expected to do. Um, data and ensuring that we're linked in with the Joint Biosecurity Centre is a key part of our outbreak control plan as well. We'll be looking into bringing data. I already talked about access to pillar two data. We're getting that as well. We regularly share a, a daily intelligence briefing with our members. We have asked that our intelligence analysts add information on pillar two testing to that briefing. All we've had till date is pillar one testing results. So pillar two testing is going to be added to that. And we'll continue to bring that together as well. Enforcement, we, we, we've made it clear within our plan that enforcement will be a last resort. So if we do everything else at the top, we, we hone down prevention and we get it right, then we will not get to a point where we need to use enforcement. But we recognise in our plan that there are certain pieces of legislation that gives us the power. There's Health and Safety at Work Act, there's the Public Health uh, Communicable Disease Control Act and the Coronavirus Act that gives us these powers to uh, put in place, in place enforcement measures, but we're hoping that uh, this will need to be considered carefully and will be a, a last resort. We know we're going to need money, and like we said, we've got some money. We've got our location in Warwickshire County Council. We have we've worked up a plan for how we're going to use this money, identifying gaps uh, and li linking those back to our outbreak control plan priorities to ensure that we don't miss a trick in 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 defining exactly what we need in terms of resource capacity. Uh, those remain our, our, our priorities. The plan has been developed, approval by the end of June. is going out to all the different boards across all three local authorities this week and next week. I said we're in response mode and we're currently responding to incidents and outbreaks as they occur. We've established uh, our sub-regional testing capacity. All our boards are established and have been stood up and they're meeting regularly. Uh, we'll continue to refine our data flows and we are producing a coordinated comm strategy. Uh, that's the end of my presentation now, and I will take comments. Thank you very much, for that, Jade. Um I have one showing at the moment, uh, Pam Redford. 
Are you there, Pam? Yeah. Thank you. Sade, um, there are some concerns that I have. Um, many, many people are not symptomatic and therefore would not consider themselves to be put forward for any sort of testing. Uh, but although they're not symptomatic, they still are infectious. Yes. So does this account for much of our very low uh, demise in the infection rate? Um. We are not, we're not, we are still getting a high level of, of infections. Yes, they're not being hospitalised necessarily, but yeah. they are still, it's a high number and it is not going down very quickly. Yeah, there is um, evidence to suggest that this symptomatic transmission is happening. Um, in order to access a test, the, the rules require that you are symptomatic. So you are not able to access the test from the gov.uk website without saying that you've got symptoms. And in dealing with some of the incidents we've had to deal with in some schools, the way we've had to bypass this uh, very uh, ridiculous requirement is to ask people to say that they are symptomatic. So if you want to test a, a class bubble, for example, where there, there are no symptomatic, the only way to get a test is to say that you are symptomatic. We are currently working with PHE to explore how that can be sidestepped. And in fact, it's one of the things that I have flagged as a, uh, a deterrent to the numbers that are, of, of people that are accessing testing. So like I said, we put the MTU in on eating this week. One of the pushbacks that's come is, well, how do we get people to go and test, knowing that a lot of people are potentially asymptomatic or might be carrying the virus? And we are exploring a range of options as to whether or not we can just ask people to turn up, whether or not you've got symptoms. Um, or just make the requirement for symptoms slightly more vague. So instead of saying you must have all of the symptoms of coronavirus to be able to test, perhaps just say if you feel unwell or all you feel is just one symptom, go and access a test. Uh, and, and those are some of the ways that we're exploring this. I, I, I totally agree with you. It is There is a symptomatic testing happening. It is ridiculous to say that you must have symptoms to be able to access a test. Thank you for that, Charlie. Um Keith? Thank you very much, Chair. Um, we've obviously had a lot of cases rumbling on in the Neaton and Bedworth, so this Pillar 2 testing stuff is going to be really, really useful. Uh, what we find with Pillar 1 tests are the older people who get admitted to hospital get recorded on the test system. And yesterday we had 13 positives reported for um, Warwickshire, nine in the Neaton and four in North Warwickshire. But, but we don't see the pillar two, which is more the working age people who, if they do get ill, won't actually end up in hospital in most cases. So really great you're going to share pillar two tests with members, but we need it to be shared with the public, maybe not daily, but at least weekly so that the public can have confidence at a district level that things are getting better, or conversely, if they're flatlining, the public need to know so that they're actually significantly more careful. Um, what we don't want to do is scaremonger or have complacency. What we want to do is have the right level of information. Uh, and very sadly, in terms of deaths, we've had two at Swift, three at Coventry and 15 at the George Elliott in June that have been notified. So, but unfortunately, all that data is a month after you get an infection. You know, it, it does take about a month to progress through for the unfortunate people who die. So I think information is going to be absolutely key. Yeah. And on your enforcement idea and, and slide, we really need better enforcement at places like supermarkets and things in the areas where these Pillar 2 tests are showing there's a lot of infection in the community. Um, that is really, really key. And I don't know if you can share with us the rough uh, amount of Pillar 2 positives we're getting in each of the districts in the last month, week or so, because that would be really useful to see how they compare with the Pillar 1 tests. Thank you very much. Okay. I'm, happy to, I, I, I'm happy to share that. It's very, very small numbers at the moment, especially when you start to break them down by districts. But I'll, I'll speak to our intelligence colleagues and see whether we can share that to the first instance. But like I said, there is an agreement that we made with them that they will add Pillar 2 testing to the daily intelligence update. Whether that will now be added at district and borough level is something I need to verify. Thank you, Chair. Just please, come back. Yes, that. carry on, Keith. It's really useful that the pillar two is a lot lower than the pillar one. That's information we didn't have, and it gives you an idea as to whether the problems are rooted in the hospital type setting 
or in the community because um, they, they test totally different age groups and totally different stages. Obviously, the Pillar 1 tests are really when you get to being admitted at the Geordie Elliott, or I believe from the staff. Is it right that the staff also get in the Pillar 1 group rather than the Pillar 2? Yeah, staff are in Pillar 1. Thank you. Margaret? Chairman. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So, um, yeah, my, my question is surrounding uh, George, George Elliott as well and the number of um, cases that uh, seem to be disproportionately high there. And, and my question really is, uh, I, I'm not clear on this, whether these are people from the community going into George Elliott. Yeah. or whether we actually have an outbreak in the hospital itself. And if we did, whether you would be able to uh, identify that and deal with it. Um, if it is community-based going into the hospital, then presumably you will have a number of outbreaks in the community which you're investigating. So it may be a combination of both, but I'd just like a little bit more clarity about where these numbers are coming from. Yeah. So we, we've had some clarity from Judge Elliot. What I can say is the data today suggests that the numbers are coming down uh, in Judge Elliot. So the, the picture is, is, is much better and it is improving. The numbers tell us that it's a bit of a mixed picture. So there is some transmission happening in hospital. Uh, so the broken down transmission by whether or not it's uh, definitely acquired in hospital, probably acquired in hospital, unlikely to have been acquired in hospital. And we received that breakdown of data. What we know is that 35% of the um, infections that happened within a, a, a one-month period happened within the community, so were unlikely to have been acquired in hospital. Um, about 16% were definitely acquired in hospital, 25% uh, most probably acquired in hospital. So it was clear that there was some transmission happening within hospital, but there was some transmission, there was some number of, there was a number of COVID uh, positive patients that had come in from the community. The next step for us now, which is what we've asked for, and as you know, this thing's happened really slowly. I've asked PHE and I've asked Georgiana Adelis to see whether or not we can have postcode breakdown of the 35% that appears to have come in um, from outside the hospital to see whether or not everybody has definitely come in from the north. Uh, because there's been some um, speculation that we get some patients from Hinkley and Busworth, for example, and it may not all be down to what's happening within the community. So I'm still waiting for that information. But well, that's what we know. But I think the, the key points to bear in mind is that the, the data that I've seen this morning suggests to me that whatever was happening to Jellyot is coming down and it is a much improved picture. Sorry, Chairman, can I just follow that up with, so um, the hospital transmission, the transmission of disease that's happening inside the hospital, is that disproportionately high compared to other hospitals? And if so, are we intervening with infection control measures, etc., that are needed to keep that yeah. up? Yeah, so we get a detailed breakdown of what's happening in Jogelio, Swift and UHCW on a, on, a, on a daily basis. It used to come on a daily basis, now it comes three times a week. And it is clear that status Jogelio is very, very different to UHCW and it's very different to Swift. So that answers your question. Uh, in, in terms of what we're doing, yes. So I put a video on, on out, which is on the on Warwickshire County Council website, which describes the steps that's uh, being taken by Jogelio. And they are doing, they appear to be doing all the right things in terms of closing all the beds, uh, closing the wards that have been uh, disproportionately affected, minimizing staff movement between the wards, enhanced cleaning throughout, um, testing, expanding testing. So whilst they started off with testing just the staff in those four wards where the um, increased number of uh, cases were observed, they are now moving to, uh, to testing all staff. So they are taking all the right steps and I, I feel, I believe strongly that that will be reflecting the numbers as we, as we move along the weeks. Thank you. Jerry. Thanks. Can I thank Shade for the presentation? Very useful, um, very helpful. And I suppose it, partly this question, because Les is now in the meeting as well, so it will save me asking this when it's his portfolio a bit as well. Um, the bit I'm quite interested in is the uh, local lockdowns and how that decision will be made. And there was a, um, a debate which uh, was sort of had with Monica yesterday um, about this as well and about how that will be triggered and how that will go on. And I know Les would be involved in that. And, and it's coming back to Keith's point, really, about local information which is out there publicly about whether it's the R rate or whatever to do with the, the community and the confidence of people out there um, and about operating. And I, and I think, as Keith said, I think it's going to be actually crucial going forward uh, as we go into the next few months 
as to that how we get that message, the correct message across. And I think the inside, the business intelligence we're getting is great, but I think that probably now needs to change going ahead, do you think? And we actually need to re be reflecting, if we can, things like local R rates and bits and pieces. So as community leaders and elected members, we could actually be if you like, the, the mouthpiece of what's happening on the ground and saying this is what's going on. But there will come, I have no doubt, at some stage where we're going to have to have a local lockdown. And I'm, I'm still not clear, and I wasn't clear from yesterday, the mechanism of how big that will be, whether that's going to be Warwickshire, Coventry, West Midlands, and nobody seems to know really until something happens where you could say, that's it, we're going to close down Nuneaton, but the rest of Warwickshire is fine. Any comments, Shade? Uh, the question about local lockdown, I've been asked many times, and my answer to that is always, that is currently not within the gift of, of local authority. If that changes, we will be made aware. Uh, we have some powers, enforcement powers, within some of those legislations that I described in my presentation, but that's probably just to lock down a particular premise, for example, if, if it is clear that they're not observing social distancing. In terms of locking down uh, a particular geography, that, uh, I believe, is, is, is not within our gift. If that changes, we will be made aware. But currently, as far as I know, it is not within the gift of local authority to make a decision to lock down a particular place. Okay, thank you. Uh, Helen. Thanks, Chair. Just uh, a couple of questions, just to follow up one question um, about <coughs> local lockdowns. So obviously it's not in the power yet of the local authority to be able to do that, but have we got any plans anyway? Because it may be a case of it happens, there's a need for it. Um, we've got a number of, a, a large outbreak, and then we apply for those powers, or those powers are given to us. But have we got any plans... What if we need to sort of suddenly instigate that? Because I don't think we should be waiting for the power to do it before we actually have a plan. Um, the other, the other question, perhaps I'm jumping the gun slightly, but the antibody test. So at the moment, antibody tests are only available for um, certain members of working in the NHS, etc. But how do we see that rolling out in the future? Do you know yet, Sade, whether? that will be available and be something that the the beacon will sort of be given. Thank you. So I'll answer the second question because that's probably easier for me to answer. Uh, antibody testing has been is now available to NHS staff and some social care staff. Um, I, I probably know as much as you know in terms of when it's going to be widely available. The, the point that we've been asked to make sure that we get across is that it is not a um the, the the solution to, to covid the ultimate solution would be a vaccine and, and that is because antibody testing just tells you if you've had it it doesn't really tell you how much immunity it's given you so you could be immune for one month you could be immune for six months it could be immune for one year and the risk of that is that once people know they've had covid and they've developed antibodies to it they will be less likely to comply with social distancing and physical distancing measures and because we don't know how this virus is, is behaving there's been talk in the news about how it's, it's mutated and it's, it's going to become even more difficult to manage and to treat in the future the whole point about antibody testing is that let's not get um, too hung up about it and, and the potential for it um, it's being used by social, by health and social care now to manage manage really the workforce pressures. So we know that if you had it, you are you've got some protection. We don't know how much that protection is. As a healthcare worker, you could potentially go back to work, and that's what it's being used for now as a tool to to give us the wider public. Uh, the again, the, the point is that it is really difficult because we don't want people to become complacent because we don't know how this virus is going to behave. Uh, going back to your first question about plans to develop local lockdowns, yes, so underneath the overarching Coventry and Solihull Warwickshire outbreak control plan sits individual local authority implementation plans. So there is going to be a lockdown action plan in case we get to that point where we've been asked to uh, implement lockdown in a particular place. But that has not been fully developed now. That is still being developed and it is in progress. Mm. In relation to the antibodies, I guess that... Um healthcare staff that have had the antibody tests and perhaps tested positive have then gone back into work 
hopefully they will be monitored to see whether they get it again or yeah. um, and that will give us evidence about whether the, the virus yeah. is mutated. Is that being yeah. done? Is that... I would imagine that it's been done. I'm not really privy to what's happening to be with people that have had the antibody testing and have gone back into work. But it, it, it I would say that makes sense to, to keep an eye on them. If they do start to develop symptoms again, that's just start to tell us and uh, build some sort of database of information of how um, the virus is behaving, how how much protection lasts, and, and whether or not it's, it's really the answer that we want. I would imagine that's happening, but I don't want to say what I don't know. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Kate, you have another question. Yeah, I just want to come back when um, Shadi said there was four wards at George Eliot um, that was infected because uh, people have a lot of fears about obviously going to the hospital and obviously most of the hospital is is, is going to be and have been fairly clean anyway. So a bit more information on these four wards and if they're now back in use and if they were the red wards, the green wards or the, the sort of not sure wards in terms of yeah, the people going into the front door, that'd be useful to know. I, and I can't provide the detail uh, on the wards, I'm afraid, Keith. Uh, I just know that the the initial outbreak were concentrated in, in four specific wards which have now been tackled. But in terms of the actual detail, no. And that's part of the reason, I mean, one of the reasons why I don't want to comment in detail about it is because NHS England are clear that we don't want to discourage people from going into hospital. We've had enough excess deaths. We don't want people to not to go into hospital and die from something non-COVID related because they're afraid they're going to contract COVID. George Ellis is doing everything that they should do. The numbers are coming down and that's the message I would like us to take away from here. Okay, thank you, Sade. Um, I haven't got any further notifications from members for questions. Oh, I have one. Pam. Pam Redford. Thank you. Um, can I just ask you about the Nightingale Hospital? Our particular one, I understand, is in Birmingham. Uh, I'm just a bit confused why if somebody is admitted to hospital um, with a COVID, with definitely COVID, they, they are not being transferred to the Nightingale Hospital there so that that releases the hospital, um, the local hospitals, whether it be George Elliot or Swift or wherever, um, that, as far as I can see, they're not being transferred there, and I thought that was a whole idea. Do you want me to take that away, Pam? I, I, I would not be able to tell you the reasons why. I mean, I can take that away. I, 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 I would actually like to know why, because okay. I don't understand. If we're getting pa patients taken into local hospitals with COVID, knowing they have COVID, um, why they are not then immediately being transferred, if you like, we'll call it the isolation hospital, um, because that actually then I... I'm quite convinced would help with some of the transmissions within the hospitals. Yes, I agree with you, and I, I'm happy to take that uh, question, Pam, and Thank come back to Paul with, with yeah, what I find out. Thank you very much, Shade. Uh, <clears throat> I don't see any more, so. I'm going to say thank you very much, Sade. You've had a very busy morning. I have uh, indeed. <laughs> answering all thank our you, questions. Up. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, I do know that all the members appreciate the work that you have put in um, to uh, the current um, pandemic. And uh, our, our thanks for appearing this morning and yeah. answering all the questions and um, those that you had some difficulty with, you're going to get the answers for us anyway, and that is very much appreciated. Thank you very much indeed from all the members. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, well, Les is back with us, I think. Yep. Um, so we're going back to item three, which is um, uh, questions uh, uh, for the portfolio holder. Um, so, uh, do you wish to make any comment to, to begin can, with, Les? Yeah, can I just just comment on on the George George Elliot because oh, I, I, I I on behalf of Cabinet have have uh, written to the um, Chairman of Governors and the um, CEO, which is Glenn Burley, uh, and have had uh, reassuring responses. So um, we have taken it as Cabinet and myself and and Izzy to the to the top to the top level, so that we are. 
um, fully supporting Charlotte, and everything she says is exactly right. Um, but we are, um, yeah, uh, fully aware, and uh, I'm putting pressure on wherever I can. Thank you very much uh, for that, Les. Uh, any questions for Les? And we have Helen. Hi, I've been trying to find the right time to, to sort of bring this up, but we have already talked about um, uh, Bain community and COVID deaths, and we've, we've all talked about social deprivation and health inequalities, etc. So my question, and perhaps this relates also to the work programme, is are we going to bring um, those issues forward on the agenda for one of the, the, the following HOSCs coming up? And um, will we have a report on that? I know Sade is doing a lot of work on, on that already, and um, she was kind enough to, to brief myself and, and the rest of our group, which was great, on the, on the COVID and uh, Bain deaths. So are we... Have we got plans to basically bring that forward to the committee with, with specific reports? Obviously, they relate together, um, but it might be nice to have something slightly separate. I don't know what you think about that. Thank you. Um, yeah, we, um, as, as far as I'm concerned in the recovery plan, um, there are no closed doors. Um, we will look at anything and everything, and uh, that's why um, members, when it comes again in the members group, uh, we, we will look at, uh, and certainly I'm very clear that um, we are uh, not going back to where we were. As, as Shade has said about her um, DPH report, um, it's about where we're at and how we move forward. Uh, and there's early questions um, about um, the relationship with SWIFT, certainly to, uh, talking to Pete Sedgwick uh, and Becky Hale. We're not talking about going back. We, we're talking about embedding all the best stuff that we've done and achieved and how we how we take take that forward. Um, it's you know where we were has gone. It it won't be coming back. Uh, and we need to pick up um, the various communities and how they're acting. Um, on on the um, which something I haven't mentioned to Charlie yet, but I will. Um, read a very interesting article and had a discussion with someone yesterday about the effect of sunlight and, and, and um, vitamin D2 on, on COVID and where it might be, and there are some papers out there, and that particularly affects um, our BAME communities and things like that. Um, so, yeah, there's probably things about that we still need to look at and, and move forward. Yeah, because although, although COVID obviously has been a, a, a terrible um incident for, for all everybody's involved in it etc it is an it is an opportunity as well it's a real opportunity to really drill down on social inequality health inequality see the connections and build on that and, and sort of move forward and try and solve some of the problems we've got in the county in the north of the county in particular um thank you yeah i think there's and i've had that discussion with ken burley about you know uh, because it came out of my discussion with him about the um, George Elliott, is that our communities are very different, and perhaps we need to do more recognition of that and, and, and deal with it, as Shardy has said. And we will do. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Helen, um, yes, I, I agree with you. Um, perhaps um, you could put a note together and share it with uh, Jerry and myself, uh, and we'll look to... Um, uh, getting those items onto the agenda following our spokespersons meeting. Um, I think they're very relevant uh, in, in the current time. Uh, and um, let's see if we can now nail some of them down. Yeah, great, thanks. Uh, any more questions for Les? Okay, you've got off... Scott free, Les. Yeah, thank perhaps, you. perhaps, thank perhaps, you. perhaps it's come late, Chairman. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Okay, um, we're on to our final uh, <clears throat> item, which is the work program. Um, we have actually um, heard from uh, Les about uh, the George Elliott, um, which was one I was going to um, uh, raise. Um, I also note that um, we really need an update um, from the University Hospital um, following their quality account, I think there was at least two out, two items which were outstanding from a previous inspection. So um, I think we need to um, look at those. Um, we at our uh, last spokespersons meeting, um, we we did highlight that um, we would like to see more briefing notes 
that is briefing notes outside of the actual um, uh, committee meetings. Uh, and um, I know Nigel is uh, looking at uh, some of those that uh, we can bring forward. Um, we've heard Helen, and I think that, as I've said, is a very good point. And um, there are issues there that I, I think that um, we do need to look at. Um, has any has anybody got any other issues that they would like specifically um, to be considered for the work program? I should say we still have a, a good extensive program, but um, uh, obviously the current pandemic is uh, taking up a lot of time. Can I um, can I add something, Wallace? Uh, that's Claire. Yeah. yeah. Um, so. Uh, it's regarding the obviously the, the changing face of healthcare uh, that we've got locally due to COVID. We also have um, potential for funding on a 106 basis with the local plans that are coming in for specifically for healthcare. And I would like to know where the 106 money is going to go. We have a rough idea of how much has been generated because the local plan has gone through and, and whatever. Um, so based on what we've got locally, and I'm sure throughout the rest of the county as well, we have a rough idea of how much 106 money will be coming in for healthcare. And I would like to know where it's going and how we can get oversight on how that 106 money is being spent and if it's going to be affected by um, by COVID. Because um, I do think this will actually reach throughout the, the entire county with, with obviously, like I said, with the local plans, et cetera, et cetera. So it would be something to have some useful oversight on because it's not something that we really ever get into the nuts and bolts of. Uh, and I think that would be quite useful. Could, could I suggest, Claire, that we, we perhaps ask for a uh, briefing note to all members um, on the current situation? Yeah, I, th I think that would be a good start and then we can, we can take it from there, yeah. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll uh, get that put in hand. Uh, Margaret. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, at our very recent Warwickshire North Place Board, I think that's what it's called now, um, we had a really good presentation, uh, although very depressing, on um, smoking at the time of pregnancy. And, and the figures in the north of the county are shocking. Yeah. It's nearly one in five women who are smoking at the time of delivery, which is just dreadful. And uh, I know a lot of work's going on in the background on this, and I think it would be really good for this committee to get a briefing on that and to show the actions that are being taken. Yeah, OK. Um, we'll set that in place, Margaret. Yeah. Are there any other um, suggestions, questions, comments for the... Ah, Chris. Chris Bain. Yeah, just very briefly, Chair. Um, I think there will be issues about the legacy of the pandemic. Um, oh. Because what we're seeing is, is um, increasing NHS waiting lists for routine matters, particularly electives, and what effect that will have in the longer term, we're not clear. And the second one is um, a mental health legacy based primarily on anxiety related conditions. People being asked to return to work and being anxious about doing so, people being locked down with people with mental health conditions for a long time. So I think there will be a legacy there um, that will need to be dealt with at some point. The, ch the challenge, Chair, is, is when you actually look at those things, because I have no idea when this pandemic will actually end. Yeah. Uh, I, I agree, it, but I do think that we should not use the pandemic for not asking the questions, uh, you know, at the time that they they perhaps, you know, sort of rear their ugly head. Um, but so, you know, I agree, But and, and that is why, um, as I said at the spokesperson's meeting, which I think you were there, um, we asked for more briefing notes so that we could keep members up to date with the issues as they're, as they're progressing. In particular, of course, for 
um, the uh, response is coming from from Warwickshire. So yes, uh, I, I entirely agree uh, with that. Uh, any other any other issues? Okay. Well, I think that virtually brings us to the end of our uh, meeting today. Um, just a, a big thank you for all your patience. Oh no, hold, um, yeah, um, all your patience, etc. And uh, and uh, we've had one or two hiccups with people not being able to 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 get in or being switched off. But um, we're still new at this game, but I think, we're, I think we really are getting a bit of a handle on it. If I can get a handle on it, I'm sure the rest of you can. Uh, so thank you very much indeed, and um, as they say, take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, Alice. Okay, Isabel, could you stop the recording, please? I have. I'm just wondering if streaming stops. Yeah, I'm any rule anyway, but would you just ping me over that and I'll try and get on with the minute send tomorrow? That's great, thank you. Yeah, sure. I'm going to email it to Public Eye later so they can upload it anyway. Okay, cool. Um, do, you, you should have the ability to trim that, so it might be just a quick worth, worth a quick look before you ping it over as a permanent record. I don't think there was anything start or end that was difficult, but... Um, it's, mm. I don't know if you've seen how to do that, but it's, it's quite easy to do the trimming of the of the, the, um, the team stuff. So yeah, I can, um, have, I can have a look. I don't really know though, but um, it's not that. I'm sure if it's not that hard. It's... No, if I can do it, I'm sure you can. But there you go. So thanks for all your help again this morning, Isabel. Much appreciated. It went very smoothly with the questions. I know Councillor Condark is still in with us, I'm sure he can agree, it went quite well, so um, thank you for that, and I'll, um, I'll catch up with you later. Okay. Yeah, see you soon. Yeah, it yeah. went quite, quite well. One quick question. I didn't quite oh, okay. mention, not note down those percentages that Sade said about the, it was 35% of the community, but I didn't have time to write down all the other ones. Well, if I if I tell you that I didn't, and I'm, I'm now reliant on, uh, I'm now reliant on the webcast for this. Um, That's okay. Because of that. When when you're trying to when you're trying to to run the meetings like this, the ability to take notes in the normal way is much impacted. Believe me. However, the stream will be available and online pretty quickly, Keith. So you, you should be able to. I just thought that. you might have managed to catch it in the um, like, because uh, she gave a lot of information very quickly, which was very good stuff. Oh, it was very if, uh, if I tell you that my internet clock twice during the meeting, then yeah. I had to actually leave and come back in twice. So, well, what I heard my wife first, her computer went first, then mine went about three seconds later because she's working in the other office across the way from the dining room. So, I've got that option. Um, and and, uh, and her, I heard her go, oh no. And I was like, oh, well, she's actually saying that, but I can't repeat it. Okay. Yes, there we go. So she's, yeah, so we're at the same level with that. But um, yeah, it will be on the stream. It should be published quite quickly, like shouldn't it, Isabel? Yeah, I'm going to, well, when it's um, on, the, on the stream, I'm going to put it on the public website today. I'm going to play it down because I know we're quite good for it.